thank you for being here tonight. And somebody once said, many people have said that wherever you go in life, there you are. And here we are at the start of 2024, starting our lives together this year with a little bit of suds and science. So thank you very much. Again, my name is Jason Hill, and I'm a quantitative ecologist at the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, and it is, it's just a real privilege to have you here. Before I introduce our speaker tonight and the topic, I want to invite you to think back in a time in your life where you had something of great meaning and value to you, but you lost it. It could have been a person or a place or a thing, something that was taken away that slipped away somehow. Why don't you think about that for a second? For me, a couple things come to mind. A couple years after my dad passed away, I saw his vehicle being driven down the road in small town Iowa by somebody else, of course, who had purchased that car. Very unique, very unique conversion van. Um, and, uh, and, and also, like a decade ago, I was finishing up my PhD work, and I had this 200-acre plot of grassland and there were trees growing on the steep hillside. And part of my PhD research was to remove and modify the vegetation structure to see how grassland bird communities would respond. Do they respond to the presence of structure regardless of the species or whatever? So it had the steep hillside on this 200 acre plot that we couldn't get the machines onto. So we cut these trees down by hand in these Pennsylvania grasslands. And then I called in a favor and got the rugby team to come in and spend the entire weekend hand dragging these 15, 20 foot tall locust trees off of this super steep hillside. And at the end of the weekend, one of these young guys came up to me with this really pained look on his face. And he thanked me for having the team out, it was good team building exercise and such, but then he mentioned that he had lost something of dear importance to him. And would I please keep an eye out for that? And he knew how ridiculously impossible it was in a 200 acre grassland of waist tall grass that I would find this object about the palm, size of the palm of my hand. But he went away pained and weeks later as I was walking through this large grassland complex, I looked down at my feet and saw this pocket knife that his father had given him before he had passed away. And I was able to return that, that object back to him, right? So I'm not saying that those experiences are the same as walking out tonight and hearing a wolf howl in the Connecticut River Valley, or going out tomorrow and seeing a flock of passenger pigeons fly overhead. But in a way, the theme is similar. It's this idea of being reunited with something that was once here, was once in our lives, and has been taken away or is missing, and has returned. And that's what tonight's theme is about for Suds and Science. And before I introduce our speaker, I just want to say thank you all for being here. This is great. You folks are welcome to come right in, make your way. And hey, good to see you. <laughs> and um, uh, I just want to say thank you for being here. I want to thank our good friends, uh, Tosh and Rick, and all the folks at JAM for recording this tonight. JAM is a fantastic local nonprofit, just like us, based in White River Junction. If you haven't checked out their new studios, I'd encourage you to head down there and check it out um, or support them. I am a member and I encourage you to do so too. We, the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, are a nonprofit and we are also located in White River Junction, just down the road. We're a group of researchers and ecologists that do very applied conservation research from bumblebees to butterflies and birds. And I encourage you to check us out and think about supporting suds and science and supporting the work that we do. Thank you to the Norwich Inn and to the Norwich Women's Club also for their support of us. With that, I am super stoked to, thank, to welcome to, to our speaker tonight, Shelby Perry from the Northeast Wilderness Trust, a uh, longtime colleague, a lot of discussion over the years. Great to have her here to talk about the possibility of rewilding New England. Folks, thank you for being here. Suds and Science, welcome to Shelby. So I'm Shelby Perry. Uh, my, t my title is Wildlands Ecologist at Northeast Wilderness Trust. Um, and I'm a lifelong Vermonter, grew up not very far from here actually in Corinth. Um, and so it's, it's fun to be around here. Now I'm based in Montpelier where Northeast Wilderness Trust is based. Um, and I just kind of want to jump right in with my own story uh, about rewilding and, and one of the ways that it um, sort of 
showed up in my life. So I wanted to call this talk Wild Echoes, um, which maybe you saw. And, um, and this story is kind of where that came from, which is uh, a couple years ago, well, a lot of years ago now. It's funny how that happens. Um, I, uh, I, <laughs> I <laughs> right, you feel me. Um, I, got a, I got a call from, it was right after I stored, started at Northeast Wilderness Trust, so I got a call from an old college professor who um, had research permits for all the things and was raising a nest of baby crows, but had to go um, out of the country on a trip to go visit some people, and he needed someone to visit his nest, of, or to babysit his nest of baby crows. Um, and so I signed up, and I went to his off-grid cabin in Maine, and I stayed there um, with the crows who lived in an aviary for a week. And um, I was expecting, you know, he said, nest of baby crows. That's what the email said. So I expected, you know, like a nest and some little mouths like this. But it turns out that crows get pretty big pretty fast. So they were all full-sized crows. <laughs> and they had little bands around their ankles of different colors. And they, had, um, they each had a name. And I knew who they were. And so I hung out with the crows for a week there. And um, I was by myself in this cabin in the woods. I had my dog with me. And every morning, we would do this walk around the property. It goes down the hill and to the stream and around and back up to the house. And I would do it at lunchtime, too. And there's a swimming hole in the middle. And I would jump in at lunch. It was really idyllic. Um, and on the last day, when the, the, um, my professor was coming back, and I packed up all my things, and I was getting ready to go, um, my dog was being really weird. She was being barky, and she was looking out the windows. And, and I thought, she's just being weird because I'm packing, because my dog and I have this like really codependent relationship, and she gets anxious when I might go places without her. Um, so I think she thought that I was going to leave her. So I thought, you know what we need is um, to go for a walk to get some exercise. So, so I got out of the cabin, and I started out on this walk down the hill. and. Um, and she did not want to go. And I thought, she's just anxious because I've packed my bag. She thinks I'm going to leave. She thinks I'm going to leave her out here or something. And I was like, come on, Mia, you need this. You need this more than I do. Let's go on this walk. And I dragged her. I put her on the leash. And I dragged her down through the woods and on the trail and was like, you'll like it once we go. you know. And, um, and we got out. And you know when you? When you're walking through the woods and then you come to the side of a stream and the stream is open and um, so because of the open um, sky, the light available over the stream, the edges of it are usually really, really thick with greenery. So you can kind of come out beside a stream and once you're out in that open, you can't really see what's behind you anymore. There's just sort of a wall of leaves and greenery. So I like popped out onto this stream side and I'm, you know, dragging my reluctant dog along. And right there on the other side of those green leaves was a sound. And I actually forgot to turn on my little speaker, but I'm gonna try to do sounds. I'm sorry guys, I know you're not this is probably not exciting for TV. Um, but I'm going to play this sound for you, which I have recorded on my phone. I'm not making a call. Don't worry. All right. Let's see if this works. I'm going to turn it up all the way. I'm going to put it right here, see if that works. And this isn't the exact howl that I heard. But it's really close in that the first one, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna tone that down now. The first one was a really clear individual howl. And I thought in my brain, in my belligerent human brain, like somebody's husky is following me in the woods. <laughs> I was like, what is that? And then the others joined in, just like in this recording. And uh, you could hear the other coyotes. And I realized something in that moment. I realized that my dog was tuned into things that I wasn't, that she knew what was going on out there when I didn't, and that I dragged her into a situation that she was very uncomfortable <laughs> with. And I should have been, too. I should have been paying closer attention. And, um, 
And so I kept her on the leash and we stayed together and we did the whole rest of the trail out and around. We didn't go back the way we came. And we got back to the cabin and everything was fine. And then a couple hours later at lunchtime, I said, all right, we're going to go. We're going to go for a walk now. I'm sure they've cleared out. Like, let's just go walk the trail. And she said, nope. And I said, OK, you win. You're right. <laughs> we're not going to go that way again. Um, so to me, that was, that was a. That was, a, that was sort of an echo of a, of a um, it felt like a wolf howl. It was very close to a wolf howl before the other coyotes joined in. And it really felt like I was hearing, like I was experiencing something that Vermonters and Mainers and New Hampshire rights and all of our other terms don't um, get to experience anymore. And um, so I wanted to tell that story as a, as sort of a, a preface to the other story that I'm going to tell, which is a story of a forest, um, our forest. And I'm going to tell it in four parts. Um, and, and I want, when I tell you that story, this is it, here's where I, I might have been too ambitious, but I'm going to try this. Um, I'm going to give you guys each a little paper. And I want you to listen to this story about forests that I'm going to tell you as though you are the animal on your paper. And there's a bunch of them in here. I'm gonna to try to give everybody a different one so I won't just like pass it around because there's a bunch of doubles because I wasn't sure how many people were gonna be here. Uh, so I'm gonna give you each an animal. Here you go, that's a cool one. Uh, if I accidentally give you two, then you can be them both. <laughs> Mm -hmm. okay. Well, that's a fun one. There you go. You can be Great. loose. All right. Does everybody get? Everybody got one? Okay. All right. So. Um, these are your personas for the next however long I talk. And hopefully you can identify with them. Um, I have a few more sounds. I'm probably going to forget to play them. But if you want to listen to them at the end, we can, we can play them. <laughs> um, and, and so I want to start this story of the forest in four parts with the story of what I'm going to call the pre-colonial forest, um, which is like the forest here in this place we now call Vermont before the people who named it Vermont showed up. So there were people here, but they weren't um, what we would call Westerners or colonists or settlers. There were indigenous people here then. Um, there were all sorts of animals and wildlife, some that are familiar to us as species here, some that we might not have realized were here. Um, and perhaps all of you. So how many of you, you, your animals, were here at the time of the, um, of the pre-colonial forest? So we're talking like, let's say 1500. Raise your hand if you think you were here. All right, who's not sure? Who's not sure? OK, all right. I'm not going to tell you. I'm just going to tell the story. And then you'll figure out where you shake out. Um, but listen for your animals. OK, so in this pre-colonial forest, what I'm calling it, um, we know from research that only about 6 to 8% of the forest was in a young forest condition. This was from research done as part of creating Vermont conservation design. They did sort of an exhaustive literature search to try to figure out what the composition and age structure of the forest was. The vast majority of the forest was in what we would now call today um, old growth. And there was 6 to 8% that was in a young forest condition. And that's from things like blowdown, storm damage, beaver meadows, things like that. So if you're the beaver, you were here. Um, <laughs> um, the streams in this forest may not look familiar to us when we think of a stream in the woods today. They're you know, braided, diffuse things with all sorts of rocks and sticks and logs in them. Um, if you listen to the Ver Vermont Public podcast, Brave Little State, they just did a great episode a couple months ago on um, old streams, and I highly recommend that. Um, so they'll give you a little of the history of that. It's a, it's a great listen. 
But um, we know that the streams and rivers were kind of wide and more diffuse and you know, sometimes jumped subsurface and um, you know, went below the ground surface and popped back up in different places. Um, we don't know, well, people who aren't me probably know a lot more about the indigenous people. I'm an ecologist, not an anthropologist, so I don't want to say anything wrong. I will say indigenous people were here. They were um, interacting with the landscape. They lived in community with the landscape. They were foraging, trapping, hunting. Um, there was small scale in some places agriculture in these early times, um, especially in fertile valleys, but it was not expansive. Um, there's some evidence that they encouraged the growth of nut bearing trees like uh, oaks and beech trees. There's some evidence that in this forest, um, you know, we had many of the same species that we have today, but they were in different concentrations. So a lot of us have heard this story. This is, this is the old, um, the, the sort of, it's like lofty in our memory, this like really cool place that we never got to see. Um, and then the next forest story that I'm gonna tell you is what I call the depleted forest. And this one comes with like a wah wah sound. Um, and this is, <laughs> This is the forest that I'm going to say was like 250 to like 150 years ago. Um, so we're, we're like right in the, in the expanding time. We're right in agriculture. We're right in clearing. There's been tons of forest clearing. Vermont went from like 95% forested to about 25% forested in between these two forests. So we're at a all time low um, for, for forested ground. It's mostly cleared for things like agriculture, um, logging, potash. We cleared a lot of things just to burn them. Um, and these were all Western settlers, of course. And, um, and so this forest, um, remember I told you those streams in the, in the pre-colonial forest were uh, diffuse and full of things. But one of the things that, that Western settlers did um, when, they, when they started logging a place was they would send advance crews out to go clean the streams. And they would pull all the rocks and all the logs and all the root wads and woody debris out of the streams so that it would flow faster and more concentrated so that it would carry the logs out in the log drive in the spring. So that was on bigger streams, but it happened on smaller ones too. People also thought it was their civic duty to straighten and clean their streams. That was like really in. So if you had property with a stream on it, you'd clean it out so that it would move faster. Um, so it really changed the character of streams. The character of forests, of course, changed because they disappeared. And with this massive decline in forests came a massive decline in forest dwelling species. And, um, you know, in an area that was predominantly forest before, most of our native wildlife were forest dwelling species. So um, we're now, let's, let's pick, we're, we're somewhere between like the late 1800s, early 1900s. Who thinks your animals are still here? Who's still here? All right, okay. Now I'm gonna read you, and I, I printed these out so I wouldn't get this wrong. So I'm gonna read you some, some, some history here. Lynx, do we have a lynx in the house? We do, yeah, all right. Between late 1700 and 2003, there were exactly four confirmed sightings of lynx in Vermont. So they weren't extirpated, but there weren't a lot of them around. Now they're, they're very elusive animals, they hide out, so there, there could have been some. More recently, there seems to be some hope that they're recovering in parts of the Northeast Kingdom, um, but they were, they were not hanging around much in this time period. All right, elk, do we have an elk in the house? All right, uh, elk used to be the most common hoofed animal in the Northeast. Most common, more common than white-tailed deer. Uh, there were big herds of elk, kind of like the buffalo in the West. They were extirpated ver from Vermont in 1800. So they were gone really early. Uh, beaver, do we have a beaver in the house? All right, you were extirpated in the early 1800s, I'm so sorry. But great news, in 1910 you were protected by law and you recovered slowly. In 1921, we brought six of you back from the Adirondacks released in Bennington County and the populations gradually recovered. Uh, caribou, I don't think I handed out a caribou. Is there a caribou here? 
All right. Okay. Well, who thinks the caribou was here? Nobody. Caribou were here but they were extirpated by 1840, sadly, and they have not been back since. Um, the closest population is in Canada, though they are considered endangered across much of their Canadian range now. Uh, the last herd in the lower 48 was the Selkirk herd. This occurred in the Montana, Idaho, kind of Canada border. Um, they were declared extinct in 2018. So there's no longer any caribou in the lower 48, but they still exist in Alaska. White-tailed deer. Do we have a white-tailed deer? I don't think I handed out a white-tailed deer. Okay, white-tailed deer. Do you think they were here in this window? Yeah, yeah. Well, you're mostly right. They were extirpated in the 1860s, but they were reintroduced in 1878. So we didn't let them go for long. Uh, we brought 17 to the Rutland area in 1878, and other reintroductions followed. Then the populations exploded following the widespread abandonment of farmland with westward expansion. And white-tailed deer hit an all-time high in the 1950s with a population of around a half million. Um, They've been sort of coming down and equalizing ever since, although they're climate change winners and their numbers are starting to go up again. River otters. Do we have a river otter in the room? I don't think I handed out a river otter. Um, river otters and black bears. I think I did hand out a black bear. Black bear. Um, I read an article saying these were both extirpated in the 1860s, but I couldn't find a lot of details about it. I read something saying that uh, otters were reintroduced in 1976, but I don't know if that's true, so don't quote me on that. I couldn't find a lot of details about those, but I did find that in 2023, the bear population in Vermont hit a five-year high, so they're doing great now. Um, here's a fun one. Resident Canada geese. These are Canada geese that breed entirely in the U.S. that don't migrate. They were extirpated in the 1860s, and there were none left in Vermont, but they were, um, Vermont established a resident Canada goose population again in 1956. Wild turkeys, eastern wild turkeys. We got one of those? Yeah. All right. Do you think you were here? Ooh, I think so. You think so? 1850s, you were extirpated. Reintroduced in 1969. Sad story, sorry. <laughs> uh, moose. Do you think you were here? You think you were here? Yeah, yeah. You were extirpated in the late 1800s, but you maintained populations in northern New Hampshire and Maine, and you slowly walked back in. So you were not actively reintroduced, but by the 1960s, populations were reestablishing themselves. And here's a fun fact about that time frame. Some of you might remember this. In the 1960s, when moose were walking back from Maine and New Hampshire, it was young dispersing males who walked back. That's as was often the case. You know, they go look for their own territories, and they look for love and they came by themselves and they couldn't find love but what did they find they found heifers <laughs> they found herds of dairy cows and the moose the male moose would fall in love with herds of dairy cows and they would hoard them up in the woods and the farmers couldn't get at them so the game wardens would have to relocate them there's a great story about it in Vermont Wild is like game warden stories. If you have any of those books or you've seen them, in one of those books, there's a great story about the wardens relocating a moose from Lamoille County somewhere, I think. Um, and they relocated him up to the Northeast Kingdom where he promptly fell in love with another herd of cows and uh, sadly was not allowed to continue with that. All right, so I got a couple more here and then I'm gonna move on to another forest. Um, cougars, do we have a cougar in the room? Yeah. Do you think you were here? Gone and haven't been back. Gone and haven't been back. 1881, the last cougar known in Vermont was shot. Um, nearest population, Black Hills, South Dakota, or Pine Ridge, Nebraska. And occasionally, dispersing young males move through, coming, looking for love. They, they don't love cows, so they haven't found anything to get excited about here yet. But um, a young male Cougar was hit by a car in Connecticut in 2011. You may have heard of him. They call him the Connecticut cat. He came from the Black Hills population of South Dakota. Walked all the way to Connecticut looking for love, only to be hit by a car. Wolves. Do we have a wolf? We have a wolf. Do you think you were here? 
No. Wolves were extirpated in the late 1800s. Um, but there is some good news for you. Recent DNA testing says that our eastern coyotes have a large percentage of wolf DNA. So eastern coyotes are bigger and more wolfy than western coyotes. In fact, one shot in the Adirondacks just a couple years ago, like two years ago maybe, his DNA came back 97% wolf. So they're sort of coming back. Um, they're just using a proxy in a way. <laughs> American Martin. Did I give anyone a Martin? Here we are. Do you think you were around? Yes. Yes. Sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> In the early 1900s, you were extirpated, um, but you were reintroduced in 1989 in what was largely considered a failed attempt. They let a bunch go down in the Green Mountain Forest and then never saw them again for a really long time. But just within the last, let's say, five to 10 years, they started showing up on wildlife cameras, and they think there might have actually been a resident population all the way through from that first reintroduction. They're just such elusive little guys that nobody saw them. But so they're back now. Sort of. Uh, wolverines. Is anybody out of Wolverine? I did. I don't think I handed that out. Who thinks Wolverines were ever here? Okay. All right. So there are records from uh, late 1700s to 1927 of all the Wolverines captured. And there are dots in New Hampshire and there are dots in New York. There's no dot in Vermont, but their population did come down here. So it's believed that at one point Wolverines did live in Vermont or at least pass through. Um, they were extirpated by the early 1900s. Uh, they were extirpated actually from the entire lower 48 in the early 1900s. But their populations are recovering in the West Western parts of their range. Um, loons, this one I have a sound for because who doesn't love listening to a loon? So I'll play you a loon sound before I tell you their sad story. We probably all know their sad story. Oh, oh I got to turn it back up. Oops. It's just a fun one to think about. Okay, sorry to cut that short, but I like listening to loons. Um, loons were largely gone around the early 1900s, and they, so a lot of these other species are forest-dwelling animals. Their decline had a lot to do with forest decline and had a lot to do with um, people over hunting and over harvesting them. Loon's story is a little bit sadder. Loon's declined, but they are also water birds. And so they declined, and then while they were down, they got kicked by the double threat of DDT and lead and fishing tackle and shot and all of those things. So it was a lot harder for them to recover. They were removed from the endangered species list in 2005. They're now believed to be 100 breeding pairs um, found in Vermont. Probably people in this room know more about this than I do. But uh, So loons are coming back. We can hear them again. Um, but they've had a little bit of a harder uh, recovery than some. All right, and the last one I have on my list is coyotes. We had a coyote in the room. Do you think you were here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like the confidence. Uh, coyotes arrived in Vermont in the 1940s. They are not they weren't here before that. They're a western species. They're a prairie wolf, was what they called them. They're smaller. They're predators of open habitats in the west. And they filled a vacuum left when wolves were removed. Um, they, they came in and they filled that vacuum. And an interesting thing about coyotes is that the way their family structure works and the way their populations work, the more we try to hunt them, often results in them increasing their populations. So um, we have waged all-out war on coyotes in this country. There's a great book called Coyote America, if you want to learn about it. Um, and they have just continued to increase through it all. Uh, so they're, they're real survivors. Um, and they came in the 1940s and filled that hole left by wolves and now are 
part wolf here. So they, they're, they're doing a better job than we even realized filling that wolf-sized hole. Um, so that's what I call the depleted forest. I'm not paying any attention to the time, but, um, <laughs> but I, got two, I got two more forest stories to tell you, and these ones will go faster. Okay, so the next forest is today's forest. We all know this forest, right? We've, we spend time in it, we've seen it. This is the greatest recovery, forest recovery story perhaps in the world. We went from nearly 100% forest to basically 25% in Vermont, even lower in southern New England, and we've recovered over the last 100, 150 years back up to um, 70% forest again in some places, 80, I think Maine is closer to 80. Um, so this is, this is an incredibly hopeful story. Our forest is coming, has come back. Uh, the, the little sad point I'll put on the end of that is that we've just started to kind of curve peak and, and go down a little. Fragmentation and development are, are just starting to push those forest numbers down again. Um, but we made a really miraculous recovery of forest cover in, in our state, in Vermont, and across the, um, across the Northeast. We are um, practicing science-based, more conservation-friendly forestry. Um, the forestry practices practiced in that last forest that I was talking about was sort of a um, ruinous policy where we just sort of cut and left things. And one of the things I forgot to mention about that forest is that tens of thousands of acres of Vermont burned in part because Streams cut down, they eroded when they're flowing faster, they erode deeper, deeper streams drops the water table, everything dries, you cut the trees, there's less, there's more sun on the forest floor, everything dries out and then, um, and then they burn. So um, thousands of acres like western scale wildflower, wildfires were affecting Vermont around the turn of the century through like the 1940s. And that's why there's fire towers on a bunch of our smaller summits um, was looking out for fires. Um, so we've corrected those policies. We're a lot better at forestry now. We do it with a carefuler touch. We're a lot more thoughtful about it. Um, but one of the things about our forests in Vermont today is that the vast majority of them are at or below the age that we would consider economic maturity. That's a forestry term. That's like when the trees are old enough to be cut down. Um, and that it usually falls between 50 and 80 years. So when you hear people talking about a mature forest and you think, oh, that must be like old growth, usually what they're talking about there is a forest that's like old enough that if you let it keep growing, it's not going to be profitable. So you should cut it down. Um, so most of our forest is between 50 to 80 years old. There's a couple isolated patches of sort of 120 plus, and then there's a, a handful of patches of older than that, of like remnant old growth. Um, I've been on a hunt working with the, um, with the state natural heritage program to try to locate some patches of old forest and we've been coring trees. We do find still, they surprise us, trees that are 200, 250 years old in places kind of that we wouldn't expect them. So they're still out there, but they're few and far between these days. Um, and so we have all of these forest dwelling species that declined in that depleted forest. And we just went through the whole list. A whole bunch of them are back now, right? But the ones that are back, they all have something in common, or most of them. I guess Martins would be a, um, an outlier in this group. Can anybody think about what, what all those animals, what's back? White-tailed deer, turkeys, bears, um, beavers. They live at the edge of the park. They do a great job living in forest edges, in young forest, in early successional forest, as it's called. Um, they, what we're still missing are a lot of those old forest specialists. And I told you this whole entire story about kind of like the charismatic megafauna. I didn't even mention the like, lichens and fungi and slime molds and like all the little bitty things in the forest that you know spent thousands of years evolving in the shade of a canopy of an old growth forest and then lost when we lost all that forest cover we very well could have lost many of those too but we weren't paying very close attention in those days so 
that's my third forest is today. <laughs> and, um, and then there's one more forest, and that's tomorrow's forest. And so I told you all of that to tell you this. The story of tomorrow's forest isn't written yet. The story of tomorrow's wildlife isn't written yet. We get to write it as the species in the room that's making all the decisions right now. So um, there are things we can do to support a wilder future, and there are things we can do to let those wild echoes just die out and go away. And um, I want to, I'm going to kind of quickly highlight like two efforts that I um, am involved in that have different facets of rewilding, and then and then I'm and then I'm going to be done with my time, um, and I'll answer any questions if anybody has them. But um, so the first effort I want to highlight is, of course, Northeast Wilderness Trust. Uh, we're a forever wild land trust. Um, we protect land as forever wild. There was a wildlands report put out by the. This is a mouthful. Wildlands, Woodlands, Farmlands, and Communities, which is a collaboration between Highstead, um, Harvard Forest, and Northeast Wilderness Trust, created this Wildlands Report. And it did like sort of a census of wildlands in all of New England. And even though Vermont has about 30% of the land area conserved in some way, that's across the whole spectrum, only about 3.7% of the land area in Vermont is conserved as wild. So that's like land that is not being asked to meet other human economic or resource extractive needs. Um, and so what NEWT is doing, Northeast Wilderness Trust, NEWT, that's our acronym, is uh, working towards putting some more of that wild land back in the landscape to make some room for some non-human animals out there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thanks. Uh, and the other effort I want to highlight just briefly is um, it's a group called the Cougar Research Collaborative. I'm part of it as it's a sort of loose collaboration of um, some academics and some nonprofits, and we're just exploring science around cougar recovery um, in the East. We're not advocating for any introductions or anything. We're just sort of telling people what what the lay of the land is. And we did um, a Google Earth Engine model. Um, it was published in Biodiversity and Conservation a year ago, almost to the day. Um, and it modeled suitable cougar habitat east of the Mississippi. We identified um, 17, I think, mm -hmm. Check my notes. Um, 17 blocks of habitat suitable for uh, populations of um, cougars, and 13 of those were larger. Yes, that was correct. 13 of those were larger than 10,000 square kilometers and therefore large enough to host a genetically healthy population. Um, and so one of the things that I think is really interesting about that study is that like where the Florida panthers are did not show up in this model. And that's accurate because they just determined that that's really too small. That's not a genetically healthy population. They had to bring in genetics from Texas to supplement the gene pool there because they weren't, um, they were having issues with inbreeding. So we have 13 blocks east of the Mississippi, large enough to host a genetically healthy population, and probably more. Some of those were split up. One of the things we used to break up um, in our modeling was highways. And so, for example, Vermont got split up by 89 and 91, but none of the, neither of those are, have enough traffic every day to really split it up for cougar movement. All it would do is maybe form the edge of an individual cougar's territory. So those could be considered um, individual, like single blocks instead of split up. So there's the habitat is there is the takeaway from that. And then the second paper we published uh, last month in, um, in biodiversity, it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. What? You're busy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and this was, we did a social science survey of residents in um, nine states that had those habitat blocks in them. 
you know, we asked questions about restoration and um, things to kind of get at social tolerance for the recovery of carnivores. And what we found was that of all the places surveyed, Vermont had the highest ratio of strong support to strong opposition. So what that means is for every person who said, I think uh, carnivore recovery or cougar recovery is a terrible idea and I will do something about that. I think it was 13 people in Vermont said, I think this is a great idea and I will do something about that, <laughs> which is kind of cool. So, um, so we look. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we didn't do Montana, wasn't one of the surveyed populations. So. Um, we did just eastern populations because we were looking at the places where those habitat blocks showed up. Um, and then we published um, another result from that that we published in Bioscience said, um, this was an interesting survey result and this is the last thing I'll share, was that one of the questions we asked was what did the respondents to the survey think their state fish and wildlife agencies should be prioritizing? And there were a list of options and one of them was restoration of extirpated or um, endangered species. And across all categories, that people categorized that as what they thought should be the top priority of their fish and wildlife agencies above the provisioning of hunting opportunities, above improving habitat, above invasive species management. Um, and this result held true even for people who identified strongly as hunters, which is pretty surprising um, as well. So <clears throat> we published that and um, and kind of showed that as a, as a potential way to, um, to encourage state fish and wildlife agencies to deal with some of this range constriction stuff, right? These species are not endangered. Cougars are not endangered. Their populations are stable. They're just not inhabiting the majority of their former range. So they're in a much smaller area. Um, and that's the same for elk. That's the same for a whole bunch of the different species that I listed today. So those are some little kind of snippets of rewilding efforts that are out there. Um, but I'll just say one more time, we get to write the next chapter of this story. And you can find something that you're passionate about and push for it here. And we can all together write a better story for this fourth forest um, for Vermont and for the region. And I'll take questions. I have questions. Yes. yes. Um, I'm a hell attack repeller for the U.S. Forest Service out of Montana. I grew up in Miami, New Hampshire. My name is Patrick Small. Huh. Um, I've been doing that for nine years now. So we're all about uh, restoring forests. Do you guys do any burning, prescribed burning? Do you so the eastern forests don't burn in the same way, or didn't, um, oh, no. in the same way as western forests. So prescribed burning is not common here. It is done in some places. The um, There's a military base in yeah. Chittenden County that does some mm -hmm. prescribed burning. They do a little bit down in the Pine Barrens in southern New England because those are much more fire-based ecosystems, but doesn't really happen broadly across the region. Um, and that's in large part because burning wasn't a big part of our ecosystems in the past. They were so wet. It was, you know, our our forests were like big sponges. There was like big coarse woody debris on the ground and moss and stuff. So it held a lot of moisture under a closed canopy. Um, so it just, it just wasn't very flammable. That's changing. Climate change is changing that. So I'm looking backward, those <laughs> old forest stories. We didn't do a lot of burning. We didn't see a lot of burning. But you all probably recognize this summer that we had wildfire smoke days in Vermont, many days this summer, where we had smoke from fires in eastern Canada. And they're not that far away. Those forests aren't that different from ours. So we might be looking at a future with more burning. Yeah. We don't know yet. Well, I was in Nova Scotia for those fires. Oh, they, were you? They yeah. Down yeah, yeah. Down into those. Um, and Lahaina, Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And I know for sure um, Montana's kind of the start. So if you know 1929, the Great Burn, mm -hmm. um, it went through Canada into Missoula, Montana, where I live. Mm -hmm. And um, burning is actually the best way to get rid of the old forests and create land for vegetation or whatever you need, wild, wildlife, anything like that. Well, that's really true for those Montana but forests. A lot of fuel on the ground by helicopters, by PSD balls, if you can drop them, or a hill of torch, you can actually make the wet fuels around here burn. Yeah, I think 
I think that's more true for Western forests. There's a lot of tree species out there that like their seeds don't even germinate unless they're burned. That's not very true for our Eastern forests. So, so it might not work in the same way here as it does out there. Although certainly the forest would recover if they burned. Yeah. Um, I guess then for the old growth forest, what was kind of their way of, of getting rid of that debris? I mean, if for, for like, you know, wildfires and stuff, it's, partially to promote new growth of the forest, but I guess, how did those old growth forests, like, because they didn't burn, how, how did they do that? How did they make new forests with all this shade and all that? How do we get from, so wait, how did they, how did the forest, how did the old forest go away, or how do we get from the young forest now to? How did the old, for, old growth forests, like, regenerate, like, without fire? Um, how was, how were, like, spots cleared out, I guess? So we, I am of the belief that any forest can become an old growth forest if you give it enough time. Um, and some people disagree with me on that, and I think it depends on your definition of old growth. It's sort of a complex term. Um, but the, the transition from an old forest to sort of the reset point, which was that depleted forest that I described, that came from in large part burning and, and you know, sort of wholesale logging and, and pulling stuff out. There was a tremendous amount of biomass accumulated in those forests and that's what made that structure, that's what made all that habitat and what the young forests of today, the economically mature forests of today need to reaccrue that structure is a lot of time. Um, there's, there's conversation about whether we can speed that up with certain kinds of management. I think there are places where that's appropriate and there are places where that's not appropriate. Um, but time is like the magic ingredient to get more old forests. Yeah. You want young and old, and so things like windfall, right? The trees mm -hmm. going down, lightning strikes, those kind of things open up spots. Mm -hmm. and so the young ones can be there. Isn't that absolutely? Yeah. Isn't that partly what we describe as the climax forest, the ability to grow in the shade of your own yeah. species? Yeah. So, so the climax forest is a is a term that. Um, so there was a belief in sort of forest development theory that you started with early successional, it was young and it was energetic and lots of growth. And then you'd get to these mid-successional forests where you get stem exclusion and there's sort of these observable phases and you'd result in a climax forest, which was sort of an unchanging, shaded, low energy, low production forest. And that's a, that's a, that has been, that view has shifted in more recent forestry theory and more recent forest development theory, I should say, um, to say, so that was a belief that disturbance was external from the forest system and not part of um, forest stand development and forest ecology. And in more recent papers, even as recent as like the um, early 2000s, they've started to look at disturbance as part of that system. So you'd see things like wind throw events and beavers and um, tornadoes and stuff making holes in that old forest. And so you'd get these patches of really verdant young growth in and patches of these old trees. And um, I'm actually working with a partner in Maine who is using, it's a little bit of a tangent, but stay with me, mm -hmm. using LIDAR, um, so plain planes would fly over and they would bounce lasers off the ground and then they would, you can get, you can normalize the ground surface to make it all flat and estimate canopy height by taking your lowest return and your highest return from the laser and you can model your canopy. And he's actually looked at the LIDAR from Big Reed, which is a big stand of old growth in Northern Maine and from other forests that are old or um, you know, younger, economically mature, whatever you want to call them, and looked at the difference in what those canopies look at, look like in that point cloud. And it's really fascinating. You can see, in Big Reed, you can see the logs on the ground in the LIDAR returns. You can see the individual logs on the forest floor. And he, took, he just took out those bottom returns and it looks like sprinkles. Like you can see all the logs across the picture. Um, and when you compare those, like the whole point cloud, the top to bottom, those real old growth forests, big reed, which has been 
Um, I don't think Big Reed was ever cut. It's not a second growth forest. It's an old growth forest. It has so much more complexity, right? There's big old forests and there's little patches where everything's low and there's big logs on the ground. And so there's big trees and there's little trees and there's sort of everything. It runs the gamut for structure and size of trees and stuff. Whereas the other old forests that are, um, you know, he went, he cored, he ground truth, he looked at all these forests. They're still in that stage of development where you're your first cohort of trees to get old are still the biggest ones in the forest and they're all around the same age and they're all around the same size. So it looks much more uniform in that point cloud. You can really see the difference between something that's been going through some of those disturbance dynamics over time and something that hasn't been. I'm curious about if, uh, if you could reintroduce carnivores or some of the kind of the top um, pieces of the food web, would that, I'm curious about those other non-animal elements of an old forest mm. and whether, that we've lost and whether you think that it's necessary or important for us to identify what they are and bring those back, um, actively reintroduce, you know, fungi or... Yeah, well that's a really great question. I. I haven't thought a lot about that. Um, one of the things that, this is just sort of a random fact that I know that I'm gonna to apply to this in a weird way, which is that I, I, as a hobby, really enjoy learning about slime molds. And I learned from a book about slime molds that you can chip the outer dead bark off any tree, live tree in the forest, put it in a moist chamber culture, and eventually a slime mold will fruit in there. So that's how ubiquitous spores can be. They're tiny, they move with the wind, they're everywhere. So spore dispersed organisms like fungi and lichens and slime molds, I suspect because their spores are very stable and very small, that if we create the conditions for those things, we might see some recovery of species that we, we wouldn't um, even know were here or wouldn't be able to identify now because of the possibility of spores. Now, seed dispersed plants, that's gonna be a lot harder for, and that's a bigger question. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I like to think of, so the work that Northeast Wilderness Trust does, we call that passive rewilding. We're not really about reintroducing um, things or rebuilding things. We're all about just sort of like hands off, let it, let it do what it wants to do, let it rewild itself. Um, and I think an important distinction to make there is that we're not looking to reconstruct that pre-colonial forest as like a museum to an ecosystem that isn't here anymore. We're really interested in letting nature build the forest of the future, and it's probably going to look different, and that's probably sad, right? I mean, I, I'm an ecologist. I love natural communities. I want to see all of our natural communities as we know them to like carry on into the future. But some of those assemblages are gonna fall apart, especially in the face of climate change and unfamiliar communities are gonna build themselves. And we need to just kind of trust that nature can figure that out and not try to force it to be what we want it to be. So I guess my inclination is to say like, if the spores and the seeds can be there somewhere and come back, wonderful. And if not, this old forest of the future is still gonna be a cool, beautiful, diverse, complicated thing that's still really important and still matters and still protects things that are, that are critical. Uh, it's just gonna look different from what we might hope. Yeah? The state of Vermont's going through the 30 by 30 process to try and preserve 30%. Mm -hmm. 30. Do you think the end product of that is is it going to be possible for the state to have land that's protected forever wild owned by the state? Right now it's impossible. <laughs> Do you think it's possible that the end product will get us there, some forever wild public property? Um, nothing's impossible. <laughs> I, I, for one, as part of that process and as part of, um, so right now, some of you, you are Montpelier area, right? So the um, Putnam State Forest, the Worcester Range Long Range Management Plan is out for comment. I will be submitting 
both comments for Newt and personal comments. And my personal comments are going to say, on that ridge line is um, some thousands of acres of state designated natural area that has no permanent protection. And I'd love to see the state put some permanent protections on their natural areas, on their no-touch areas. Um, and so I'm going to say that in my comments, and you should too. Yes. <laughs> and of yeah. all the places, oh. like just to follow on that, where there's a potential for those 4,000 acre plus ecological reserves, there aren't that many of those places, and that's one of those places. Yes, that's and one. The current plan does not provide for designation of an ecological reserve there. No, and so I, there may be conversations about upgrading those protections as part of that 30 by 30. I'm not directly involved in that process. I've been sort of following it from the outside. I raised my hand and said, I'd love to give you comments when you're ready to talk to me. Yep. Um, me too. So, <laughs> great. <laughs> so I don't know what will come out of it. I know a lot of the people who are involved in it, and I trust them. So um, I think there are some great voices in the room, and I'm hoping some great things will come out of it. Um, but I'm not sure if it will come out of that or where, how it will happen. Um, but I really would love to see the, the state create some sort of an ecological reserve category like Maine has and New Hampshire has. And Yeah. How well is the uh, forever wild provision of the New York State Constitution uh, succeeded in preserving uh, the Adirondacks? Fantastically. It's done great work. There's... Maybe there's Maybe <laughs> there's 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 hundreds of acres, thousands of acres of old growth in the Adirondacks. Um, this is one of the things that was on my note paper that I just glossed right over when I was talking about those forest fires. Is that fires in upstate New York were part of the um, the culmin the creation of the Adirondack Park? It was burning. The mountains in the upstate in upstate New York were burning. Um, because of irresponsible logging practices, and it fouled the surface waters coming out, which flowed down to New York City. And they were like, you're messing up our drinking water. So they created the largest national park in the lower 48, or state park, state quasi park, whatever it is, private state park um, that that has incredible protections, the forever wild clause of the state constitution. and hundreds and hundreds of acres of old forest, thousands of acres of old forest and old growth forest. Um, and they're, they're a great example of how it can be done and how it can work. But there's a fundamental difference between like the Adirondack and the national forest system. Yes. In terms of how they're managed and how they're preserved. And that's sort of a, that's sort of a judgment call about what you think is better. I mean, the National Forest System is, is you know, multiple use. Historically, they've had a lot of forestry, although less and less over time. Well, and one of the things I didn't say is that that 3.7% of Vermont that is conserved as wild, most of that is federal. Those are all the wilderness areas in the National Forest. So the, actually, the National Forest is doing their part in Vermont. It's the rest of us that are a little behind. Yeah. Um, and I, of course, would never, I'm not advocating for a all one thing or all the other. I think it's both and. We need lands for forestry. We need young forests. We need economically mature forests. And we need just plain old, old forests. We need it all. It all has a place. And it all needs to be in its place. And I, my fear right now is that the genuinely old forests, not the mature, but the genuinely old forests are, are underrepresented in the spectrum of uses. And I'd like to see them come up, but I'm not saying it should replace everything. I think there are lots of places where multiple uses makes a lot more sense. So did COVID ramp that up? So in Montana, COVID really ramped up Californians and a lot of people, not just Californians, and I'm not, I, I would want to leave California too, just to be honest. Um, they came to Montana and started building houses all in our forests and they didn't know how to protect their homes. So they had trees overhanging their homes. And so they are risking wildland firefighters' lives by having their trees overhanging their homes and the fire would go in the camp. Yeah, they don't have defensible space. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I just realized that I haven't repeated any of these questions, so I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> you were supposed to remind me. <laughs> um, but the question was, and I'll paraphrase slightly, <laughs> is that in Montana, lots of people during COVID moved into the sort of wildland um, and I think they call it like the wildland urban interface or developed interface and did not create appropriate defensible space. Um, and in Vermont, we had a, a sort of similar influx of people building houses and um, and buying houses, buying land. Certain areas, especially tourist prone areas, are seeing sort of record development. Um, so it's happening here. And there's a lot of things that, you know, we have Act 250, which helped prevent sort of large scale development like that. But um, these sort of one home at a time things are really chipping away. And that's part of what's driving that. I remember I said we were, we were sort of peaking. We returned to 70% forest and we're just starting to go down again in the percent of Vermont that's forested. And part of it is from development pressures from people moving in from outside and breaking up those forest blocks. Well, I understand that people want to move in from outside. Who would? Like, mm -hmm. It's a nice area. It's a great place to be. But um, like tree services and mitigation services around the area, it's good money. It's not like it's bad money. I mean, it's hard to it's hard to make a living around here with the housing prices, right? So it's hard to live if you grew up around here. It's hard to live. Like a house, a crappy house is like five hundred thousand dollars, right? But um, at least if they're going to buy homes for twelve million dollars, wherever the hell it is, they can at least hire some locals that can mitigate the trees around them. Yeah, I think for here because we don't have. Um Wildlands, wildland fires to the scale that they have in the West. That, def the that defensible space issue is is still an issue, but it's not as big of an issue as it was. And like I said, the future forest may burn more, so it may become a bigger issue. Um, I think one of the biggest issues we have around here with fragmentation and development is just. Um, sort of little roads, spur roads, going to the middle of forest blocks and clearing around a little house in their own little personal pond and you know whatever they wanted and just sort of nickel and diming away at those those blocks of like well, large enough to have ecological you integrity. Are absolute, you're an absolute blast. I love listening to everything you said. You have, but what I'm saying is that people, so the second you guys are going to learn is the second when firefighters start dying near these homes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean. I'm not trying to give advice to anybody about how to how to maintain their yard or their defensible space. I think just um, from like a ecology perspective, because I'm not a firefighter and I, I can't speak to the firefighter perspective. But from an ecologist perspective, my the reason I'm calling out development is a little bit different. And and the issue you're bringing up is no, is still very much an issue. It's just not one that is on my radar. Can I have the last question? Yes. Uh, and just wrapping it up, and I'll speak right into the lapel mic. Um, we talked a lot tonight <laughs> about our species and the possibility of extirpated species returning. What about states to the south of us? Nations that own land closer to the equator who are thinking about assisted migration of their species poleward to preserve mm. their future. Where do they fit into our New England landscape? Oh, this is a tough question. Um, yeah, I know. And go. <laughs> Um, gosh, I, I think that's one of those, we are going to build a better future forest and we're figuring out what it's going to look like. And I, I think there's, there's so much that's going to change with climate change. There's so many things that need to move around, that need space to move around. There's so much that's going to just sort of scramble that, um, I can't say specifically what would be a good outcome for places further south but i do i don't want to see just like huge amounts of biodiversity wink out because they can't get where they need to be so i don't know what that looks like i don't know how to solve that i think that's future shelby's problem and today <laughs> shelby is done <laughs> last last observation question yeah. all right say it loudly because i don't so, want to repeat it yeah the, the thing that I haven't heard you mention, and I've appreciated the, 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 the kind of the infusion of hope of what has already occurred, 
in terms of uh, reestablishment of, of species. And it's had everything to do with a reestablishment of a place for them to live, mm -hmm. forests that have grown up. Mm -hmm. The th the thing that I'm I'm really hopeful about that has a, like a double positive whammy is if we can show enough cultural restraint mm. and political will, which is going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but I think that there's enough uh, both love of what could happen and fear for what might happen mm -hmm. if we don't show restraint that, you know, we have the lifeboat of North America around us in terms of forests that are, are sucking up uh, carbon. Uh, well, the, the, in the greater scheme of things. This is a very long question, sir. Wrap it up. <laughs> so, I just, I, I'll keep listening to it. I, 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 really, I really hope that instead of solving the problem of clearing trees around incursions into core forest, we find a way to not have incurs, incursions do, into forest. I'd rather not have those cut down the tree jobs and have other kinds of jobs of infilling cities and, and communities. Uh, for people to live more affordably, and uh, and I'm just really appreciative of the the work that you're doing, and uh, you know, you're, you're saving the world <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. So thank you. Thanks, Daryl. <laughs> I planted him. <laughs> Would you All right. please check out the Northeast uh, Wilderness Trust website? Please think about supporting Jam. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Tosh, for being here tonight. And check out our website, Vermont Center for Ego Studies, for the rest of the Suds and Science schedule. Hope to see you next month. Thank you, Shelby. Great to have you here. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs>